Welcome back guys to another book review. Today we're going to be talking about Life After Google by George Gilder, um, subtitled The Fall of Big Data and the Rise of the Blockchain Economy. And I just finished this book yesterday and I kind of want to tell you guys how I stumbled across this book, why I decided to pick it up. I ran across one of uh, George Gilder's speeches on YouTube and it struck me that he was someone who has, you know, obviously lived a, a long learned life. He's written over 20 books, I think. Um, and one book that he wrote in 1990 was a book called Life After Television, in which he predicted that the computer of the future would be as portable as your wallet. And, you know, it would, it would be basically the remote of your life, I think is what he says. And his predictions basically came true. And so someone who's proven themselves historically someone who has lived uh you know has lived a lot of life and has seen the evolution of technology it just struck me that this was someone whose book i should read and so i picked up life after google and i'm going to talk about some of the predictions primarily in the book uh, but before i get into his predictions i kind of want to talk to you guys about what uh, mr gilder accomplishes in this book what he what he argues and um you know, sort of what life after Google looks like. In the beginning of the book, uh, Mr. Gilder, he talks about the evolution of information theory. And he starts off by contrasting Google's theory of knowledge to uh, uh, Newton's theory of knowledge, which he, he traces not only the intellectual evolution from Godel to Turing to um, Sh uh, Shiten, uh, Clark Shannon to uh, Gregory Shiten, and eventually to Google's theory of knowledge, which he kind of uh, can, says can be best described as big data, right? And he contrasts the idea of big data to Newton's more deterministic theory of knowledge, um, which was very much rooted in physics and um, as it relates to economics, uh, uh, rooted in gold and, and scarcity and the, you know, the, the, the scarcity of time, but also the scarcity of gold, right? And he contrasts this to Google's theory of knowledge, which he says is the paradigm that kind of rules um, in today. And their theory of knowledge is built on the idea that Google will be able to uh, predict and aggregate or be able to make predictions about the future based off of uh, aggregating data and then, you know, running uh, just being able to better synthesize that data and make predictions. And what he says is, uh, you know, sort of flawed in this theory of knowledge is that it depends on, um, it depends on knowledge and infer, it depends on a system of the world in which people are giving things away for free which George or Mr. Gilder says is fundamentally not how the world works, right? So how, what does this mean? Google's business model is dependent on giving away things for free. Um, you know, whether it be their search engine or YouTube or, you know, their uh, Gmail, all these things that they provide, services they provide. And their hope is that by giving away things for free, that they'll be able to extract all this data and then use it to achieve their ends. And it's really interesting how Mr. Gilder kind of draws this like dichotomy between, um, I guess like general AI and sort of AI uh, thinkers in, in Silicon Valley um, as opposed or compared to uh, virtual reality. And he kind of critiques uh, some of the, the AI theorists and shows how their uh, beliefs and thoughts of how things will develop in technology and theories of knowledge are also fundamentally flawed, similar to Google's. And he really critiques the business model of Google as well. You know, like I said, in order to aggregate a lot of data, you have to give away things for free and really nothing is free. What you exchange for services from Google is your time. And you exchange this in the form of advertisements, which he kind of says is the Achilles heel of Google. And he, he then jumps into the crypto cosm, uh, what he calls, you know, the new blockchain economy. And he talks about different rules that the crypto cosm 
um, has. And the, the number one rule he says is security first. Um, if, and he says that if security is not integral to an information theory uh, or infor information uh, architecture, then that architecture is, is, is wrong by design and it can't be fixed. And in the beginning of this book, he does this like really interesting kind of like, uh, I don't, it's not really a thought experiment, but just kind of like walks you through, you know, password resetups and, and captchas and, and all these like headaches that people uh, undergo as, you know, as, as it relates to online security. And what he says is that whenever you give away things for free, as Google does, you, you essentially disincentivize uh uh, a premium on security and the crypto cause I mean, he goes through a number of rules I think there's like seven or eight rules and one of them is that nothing is free right so security first and nothing is free and he goes in the rest of the book to explore different aspects of the crypto cause personally I was most interested by chapters 11 and 12 in which he explores uh, you know Bitcoin and uh, chapter 12 in particular, he has like this fictional interview with Satoshi Nakamoto that I thought was really, really interesting. Um, but he goes on in the rest of the book to talk about a, a host of other blockchain projects and I guess sort of tangential businesses and services that will be necessary for the infrastructure of a blockchain economy, a company such as Hello Digital. Um, companies such as OTOY. He talks about a couple of different projects that I am, I was already aware of, like Filecoin, and a couple of them that I was not familiar with, like Render from OTOY, um, Golem, which I've heard of but hadn't really looked too much into, and then also uh, Neo, which is like the Chinese version of Ethereum, right? And it's not all praise from Mr. Gilder, right? He, he does critique uh, Ethereum in the book. He critiques uh, Bitcoin. Um, he, he offers a, a lot of insights, but there was three predictions in particular that I want to get into that I thought were really interesting. Uh, the first one, he says, he's talking about a, a, the future of virtual reality and, and a metaverse, right? And he says, in a world of abundant information but scarce time, what do people value most? The only things that are increasingly in cost while everything else heads to zero are human experiences. Cheap and abundant virtual reality will be an experience factory. OTOY's metaverse is something entirely new. Its virtual worlds will be almost indistingu indistinguishable for many purposes from topology of the real world. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go too much further into what he's saying, but he basically is, is saying that there will exist a, a metaverse that looks very similar to Earth. And this kind of got me thinking about projects that I am familiar with, uh, such as Decentraland. Uh, companies such as Sony have, uh, have always been working really hard uh, in, in, in virtual reality technology. Companies such as Snapchat have been... Um, iterating on augmented reality and also that feature where you can go into the map and kind of see the world around you, right? Like it, it's very easy for me to kind of imagine how um, that evolution will play out. And uh, OTOY, he, he talks, it gives a pretty compelling case as to the role that company might play in this future. Um, going on to another prediction on page 202, he says, the new internet computer architecture and security model of the cryptocosm means the eclipse of the existing Bell's Law regime of condensed cloud processing at data centers, teeming with the siloed applications and customer data of particular giant corporations. So essentially what he's saying here is that uh, the cryptocosm will disperse the clouds in the era of cloud computing, which is essentially just um, centralized siloed data firms, uh, data centers, I'm sorry, are, are going to be dispersed. And this got me thinking about companies such as Urbit, um, which is an individual cloud computing uh, network, peer-to-peer -peer encrypted network, um, a really cool project that I've been interested in, I've been following. And yeah, again, I just it's easy for me to imagine how this future looks. 
The last prediction he makes uh, that I'm going to talk about is on page 211. And he says, Just as the internet could mobilize rooms or cars or even the labor of private citizens around the world, so blockchains can organize the computers of the world. When the computers are so engaged, it will be only a matter of time before the rooms and cars and jobs will follow. And so... I, I, I'm not entirely sure what he means in this paragraph, but it seems like he's talking about not only an internet of things, but an economy, uh, a virtual economy, right? And so not only will computers be able to better talk to each other and make decisions um, in this cryptocosm, in this, in this blockchain economy, um, but also tangible assets in the real world will be better integrated into this this network as well computers smart homes right and so he's really it's almost like that xenon girl of the 21st century type of predictions um where like you'll walk into your house and the walls will talk to you and it's not hard to imagine how we move from you know amazon alexas and google homes to a future in which you know my 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 fridge and my my washer and dryer are synchronized and, and compatible with my phone and, and all these um, these different things and I know this is really kind of uh, cosmic this this book review if you will but this book is far and beyond I, it's very early in 2018 but I can already tell that this is going to be I mean 2019 I'm sorry but I can already tell that this is going to be kind of that book of 2019 for me, similar to how Seyfedean Amus's The Bitcoin Standard was the uh, that book of 2018. And it's interesting that I, I read these books around the same time, um, you know, years apart. Um, but yes, I this I don't do this. Sorry about that. My phone memory got full. Um, I'm just going to close by saying I really don't do this book the amount of justice that it deserves. Um, George Gilder's just brilliant and there are, there are so many insights in this book, so many great takeaways. I give the book a 5 out of 5. I um, highly recommend it. Link to this book will be in the description. It is an Amazon link and it is an affiliate link. And I really appreciate it if you're interested in buying this book if you go ahead and click that link. They don't charge you anymore for buying it but it does help me out, helps me grow this channel and helps me continue to do uh, what I like to do which is make book reviews and yeah. Thank you guys for watching this, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.